Welcome to the second half of the Startup Showcase. My name is Laura Fry. I'm the COO and co-founder of Change Catalyst. At Change Catalyst, we are empowering inclusive and diverse tech innovation through education, community engagement, and startup programming. As part of our startup programming, we are engaging early stage underrepresented entrepreneurs, both offline and online through our tech inclusion platform to provide access to networks, mentoring, um, access to funds, and talent, and more. So as part of that startup programming, we are doing this showcase, the first Tech Inclusion New York Startup Showcase pr presented by Techstars uh, to feature 11 outstanding entrepreneurs from New York's vibrant startup community and edtech, fintech, and software as a service. So for the format of this showcase, we had a pitch session earlier today at 2. Here we are doing a um, pitch session of six entrepreneurs. Each entrepreneur gets four minutes to pitch and three minutes of Q&A with our panel of judges. And then the judges are scoring the, the pitches by um, content and delivery. And we'll be announcing those winners at the closing ceremony. So before we begin, I wanted to introduce our panel of judges. Between them, they have experience as entrepreneurs, angel investors, early and later stage investors in media and technology, emerging technologies, and, um, and marketplaces, and the sharing economy. So, uh, please give me a warm welcome. Um, give a warm welcome to Kanye Mak Makubela, general partner of Collaborative Fund. Thank you. Lisa Chai, senior vice president of research at Palisade Capital. And Lorraine Pendleton, a member of the Pipeline Angels. Thank you. So let's kick off this second half of the showcase and welcome Margot Wright from Yenko to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Margot Wright, and I am the founder of Yenko. And I started Yenko because I believe that all students have an need an opportunity to graduate from college. We provide financial aid retention software for colleges that are struggling with retention because when students lose their financial aid, they tend to drop out of college. I only was able to afford Harvard and Stanford because I have financial aid. And what I found was, in order to maintain financial aid, you had to meet academic benchmarks. Fortunately for me, I didn't have to worry about that because the only thing that my parents had me focus on was school. I'm more the exception, however, than the rule. The majority of students who are in college today are students who have to juggle school, work, and family. They tend to be older, they tend to have children, they tend to work full time, and for them, meeting these academic benchmarks that are required for financial aid can be more difficult, if they even know about them. And so you have students who enter community colleges, and 40% of them will not meet the financial benchmarks for academics for financial aid because of this particular issue. There was a school that I studied in New York, a four-year college, and of the students who dropped out, more than half of them had dropped out because they hadn't met the academic benchmarks and they had lost their academic scholarship. At that school, if those 184 students had continued into the second year, that would have been an additional $4 million just for one year alone. When you look at four-year colleges across the country, the cost of attrition is $16 billion, in no small part because of this issue of students losing financial aid. That is a problem that Yenko has been designed to solve. So our financial aid retention software addresses this problem specifically by providing students with analytics, planning, training, tracking, and communication tools that support their success. And so first, our financial aid monitor, which is pulled, pulled students' academic and financial aid data from the school, gives students an early alert when they are at risk. And so students can figure out exactly what GPA and what credits they need in order to maintain their financial aid. And they can see as it drops how their financial aid drops as well. Then our academic planning tools tie that particular GPA and credits to grades for each of their classes so they can manage their time. Then the grades dashboard allows students to track their performance. So if you're falling behind, you know in week four rather than in week 14 when you can't do anything about it. And then lastly, we provide 
communication tools. And so we send push notifications to students when they're falling behind, as well as to remind them of key deadlines that may be coming up as well. So in order to get this vision off the ground, I've assembled a team that is poised for success. And so my background was overseeing college access and college success at the Harlem Children's Zone, which is a nationally known nonprofit for, um, that end, that's focused on ending generational poverty. And our CTO and head of product have each 15 years of experience in building and scaling enterprise software. Our advisory team rounds out our, 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 our team of powerhouses. And so Sarah Goldrick Rabb is a nationally known expert in financial aid and higher ed. And our, um, and our, our advisor around higher ed also has experience both selling to higher ed as well as being an entrepreneur himself. And so our progress so far, we won the Milk and Pen Grand Prize um, last year, and it's an education prize that is one of the most well-known in, um, in the country. And we, we actually did a, a proof of concept um, test with one of our, with the school. It was a paid pilot, and what we found was that using our products, students were able to increase and, and meet financial aid eligibility more than the students who did not use our product. Next steps for us are for us to get into more schools, and to get our product to scale. And that is Yenko. Thank you so much. Wow, exactly four minutes. <laughs> now we leave it to the judges. Hi. Hi. Um, can you walk us through how you'll, you'll make revenue? Sure. So we sell to universities that are struggling with retention and graduation rate. There are about 2,600 of, of those schools in the United States. And we, we charge them on a per student per year model. Um, and so it's a SaaS model that is charging all the students in that particular institution. And then we also generate revenue from um, our implementation fee as well as consulting fees as well. But the core of our revenue model is based on a per student per year model. So, the, um, so the, your customers are just the universities, so the students aren't paying. The students um, are not paying. So it's, a, it's it basically the universities are using your platform to help retain um, students. Exactly. And what's... Um, what are, like, what's the typical fee arrangement? So for a university that has 1,000 students, it would be $20,000 $20, per year. And then do the students, uh, are they, is it required by the universities the way you're anticipating it, or is there supposed to be some sort of conversion from the university for the student adoption? So it's not going to be required, but it will be highly suggested. And our entry point for distribution into the universities are for freshman year experience classes. And so the kinds of students and schools that we're targeting have realized that helping students understand what they need to do to be successful is really critical. And so those schools typically have a required course that students have to take that will teach them about note taking and studying. And so that's our entry point into those schools. Um, and we've designed the product so that it's fun and inter interactive for students so that it'll get them engaged in really understanding what are the key drivers for maintaining their financial aid and for academic success. Um, one of your slides indicated you have a 25% close rate. Um, yes, yes. Um, could you just talk about that close rate and whether, sure. what, what did you learn from that? Sure, so we targeted schools that were specifically struggling with retention and so had retention rates below 80%, so they lose 20% of their students after the first year and who were graduating students who are who, uh, at less than a 60% rate. And so I reached out to them cold and of the schools that, um, that we reached out to, we ended up closing one of those schools. Yeah. And how long did that take from the beginning? To Our the sales end? cycle was six months. Okay. Yeah. Are you finding that the schools are mostly, well, I guess it's a small sample size, but are you finding that they're mostly buying in Q1 of the year? Or like when is, when is the opening where you can make the sale? The best opening is actually Q2, right after graduation before the, um, Q2 and Q3. Um, right after graduation during the summer where there's a little bit more of a lull. Um, but we anticipate that we'll be generating revenues at the beginning of fall and at the beginning of spring. How big is, you said you targeted schools where, you know, they are, the retention, they had some issues with retention. So obviously that's a market, but how, like, with, how, what's the market size, how, the addressable market size? Sure, so the market size is about 825 million um, in our particular, for software specifically, that is focused on retention. We're at time. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, so you. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yenko. Now please welcome to the stage Eva Dundis from Branching Minds. 
Hi, I'm Dr. Eva Dundas. I am the Chief Learning Officer at Branching Minds, and I'm also a Developmental Cognitive Psychologist. Our CEO, Maya Gatt, was a former classroom teacher. And as a classroom teacher, she had a consistent problem. And that was she knew what students in her class were struggling. She knew what content they were struggling with, but she had no idea why they were struggling or what she should do to help them. Now, as a developmental cognitive psychologist, I know that understanding why a student is struggling to learn is critical for understanding what you should do to help them. Um, this isn't just a problem that classroom teachers experience. It, there's a ripple effect that you see with uh, this problem for administrators who are required to document and report on the efforts that they're making to support struggling students. This is a massive problem not just for the 5% of students who are receiving special ed services for a specific learning disability, but also the 60% of general education students who are not meeting grade level expectations. That's nearly two thirds of our students our schools are not properly supporting. That's where Branching Minds comes in to fix this. Um, Branching Minds is a web application that uh, merges the learning sciences with technology to streamline, focus, and personalize intervention for schools. We do this with three core functions. We have a diagnostic that helps teachers understand exactly why their students are struggling. We then have a recommendation algorithm that suggests which interventions have the most evidence for supporting that student's constellation of needs. And then we help schools collaboratively report and monitor progress so they can meet compliance measures. Uh, our team is made up of our CEO, which is uh, Maya Gatt, uh, the former classroom teacher who brings in that teacher knowledge and expertise. Uh, myself as a learning scientist. We have two engineers who combined have 15 years of experience from companies uh, like Sailthrough, Bloomberg, um, and Goldman Sachs. And then David Major, our uh, co-founder, who is a veteran startup entrepreneur. So where have we come so far? So the concept for Branching Minds was born in 2013, and our beta was released in 2014. In the last year, uh, we were able to sell into 20 districts with over 100 schools uh, in eight different states, bringing in 150,000 in revenue. And then in this past year, um, we've uh, won awards both domestically and internationally um, and are set to scale into over 50 districts across 15 states, bringing in uh, 400,000 in revenue. Um, we sell district-wide licenses um, at a uh, per, uh, $6 per student times enrollment uh, charge. Um, with the uh, 400 um, million students in K-8, um, we've also seen, um, we're also starting to look at uh, state level uh, deals, talking to departments of education, will, which will allow us to scale to that very, very quickly. We've also seen um, uh, early evidence for market opportunities um, with um, private companies like Teach for America um, and private tutoring companies, as well as higher education and the consumer market. Um, we've also received um, early interest from international um, organizations. So essentially, Branching Minds um, is uh, a solution to support students anywhere who are struggling to learn. And time. Thank you. Um, could you talk about your sales model? Is it direct sales at this point? Yeah. So we're selling to school districts. We um, are usually, we're targeting uh, sales conferences with superintendents. Um, we also then have meetings with stakeholders who are um, experts at the district level and also principals. How many salespeople do you have? Um, we have a team about five. And are you also finding that when you sell to a district, the principals and the teachers adopt at a consistent rate across the schools, and what is that rate? Yeah, so, so we actually did a pilot study specifically looking at staff adoption because it is a district sale. 
Um, and in just using Branching Minds for, for three months in a, a Chicago area public school, we had 95% of teachers say that Branching Minds has improved their ability to support their students. So it's um, pretty great acceptance with the teachers. How long is the sales cycle? Um, about 60 to 90 days. And is it, most, is it teachers across classrooms, or is there a specific type of teacher that... So, yeah, so the goal is really to help collaboration and communication across all teachers and staff at a school who are supporting students. So you have the general ed teachers who are using it, um, support staff, interventionists, um, anyone who's leading kind of an intervention team, which can often be principals, as well as that reporting, which then feeds up to administrative levels because they're able to extract the data that they need. So it's, it's school-wide. What's the current um, the revenue mix, the license versus professional services? 75% is uh, recurring revenue. Can I ask one more question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so is the expectation that when a school signs up, every teacher is going to use it? And if that is the expectation, if not every teacher uses it, does it not work as well, or does it break, or what happens? Well, we're, we end up being embedded into their intervention system. So the intervention teams um, really start using it, and then it gets spread out through a train-the-trainer model. Um, so really, um, it, it starts being diffused down that way. Um, and so when a teacher has a student who enters the intervention process, um, that's when they, they adopt it. I think we have time for one more question. Okay, I have one more question. Uh, I, I, and it's actually a follow-up to the original question, which is I still don't quite understand the uh, conversion rate from the district to the school. Is When you sell it to a district, does every school use it, or does a certain percentage of schools use it? And do you expect that to change when you sell to the state? Um, so they can decide to do a pilot within a subset of their schools, which some have. Other districts immediately go, go district-wide. Um, in selling to the state, the way that we've, they've been setting up grants to be able to use branching mines, so the sale still goes through the superintendent, the money is just coming from the state. So it works the same way. It's just easier money for them to, to sign off on. Congratulations. That's Thank really you. Great. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> Next up is Jason Rosado from GiveQuick. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Okay, hello everyone, my name is Jason Rosado. I'm CEO and president of GiveQuick. Um, we help companies give away money. Uh, we function as a plug and play foundation. Um, so essentially any size company can use our platform to engage their customers and or their employees in their corporate philanthropy. Um, companies give differently than individuals do. Individuals, especially older individuals, tend to be more pri private about their giving. But with companies, any transaction that has of a philanthropic nature has the opportunity for marketing engagement with their corporate culture. Um, so we use software and services to work with nonprofits, um, get their stories, you, uh, obtain highly visual, uh, highly impactful uh, inventory and assets to allow a company to maximize the impact of their corporate philanthropy. Um, and so, as it looks like on the screen, we work very hard with nonprofits to position them to um, provide the types of assets that companies need to uh, take advantage of it as a, uh, as a uh, marketing opportunity. So, uh, how do I advance? So, oh, that. Okay, so um, our total addressable market is huge. Um, we built our platform th through client revenue. Our first uh, corporate client is PricewaterhouseCoopers. Um, over the course of four years, we've helped them, actually by the end of this year, we will have helped them give away $8 million. Um, so we're focusing on philanthropy, not fundraising, where philanthropy, um, the money is already there. We're just democratizing the decision making around where that money should go. So rather than having two or three people inside of a boardroom decide where a million dollars should go, 25,000 employees could decide, or a million customers, if you will. Um, and we make that simple. Um, so. The entire landscape of companies is, at our, is, is our opportunity, um, but we've started with Fortune 50 companies to help us build out our platform on their dime. Um, but the huge opportunities, uh, SMB, small to middle market sized companies um, that don't yet have the resources for a foundation to incorporate, they plug into our platform. 
Um, so our business model right now is a hybrid agency slash platform whereby we built out a lot of our platform and then we work like an agency to customize some of the solution specifically for our customers. Um, and then where we're moving towards is a SaaS based model, something I call a reverse Kickstarter, where you go to Kickstarter, you don't talk to anyone, you create a campaign, you're raising money. Uh, with our platform, someone inside of a corporate will be told, oh, you have a $150,000 budget to give away. Go to Give Quick, figure out what types of campaigns you want to use that are off the shelf, uh, be it an employee engagement campaign, a customer engagement campaign, a loyalty and rewards conversion point campaign, um, and we'll deliver that uh, for them very quickly and easily. Um, from a milestone perspective, as I mentioned before, we, we've given away um, through our platform, we've given away $7 million with a, a global consulting firm, PwC. We just signed Vodafone Americas. We're going to help them do their matching gift programs with their employees. Um, we've given away uh, $200,000 in grants to a uh, few uh, customer-driven campaigns as well. So we're proving that our platform can support both employee engagement and public uh, customer engagement as well. And we've been featured in TechCrunch, Harvard Business Review, and Forbes as well. Um, and our team uh, is diverse in nature as well. Um, my background is in banking and financial services, 13 years uh, learning, uh, providing technology-based fintech solutions, helping Fortune 50, comp uh, Fortune 50 companies accelerate their receivables, automate the payables, and um, gain access to data for their working capital management. And I finally, after many years of pulling off my tie and saying, what am I doing with my life, I decided to start this company. Uh, my uh, organization is diverse in nature as well. We're still very lean in terms of an organization, um, but our, our recruiting and hiring for our consultants is very diverse. In time. Thank you. Could you talk about your reason for changing your revenue model to SaaS platform sure. and what happens to your transaction fee? Our transaction fee goes down, um, but our volume of clients goes up. Um, so when we can move from a, in, a resource intensive sort of agency type model and move towards a self-serve model, uh, we, can gain, we can shorten the sales cycle and bring more clients on. Um, the reason why is so that we can um, basically get more clients <laughs> um, and not have to um, deal with the sort of interplay of this sort of custom solution, but can present a suite of already existing platform-based solutions to a corporate client and have them simply decide a la carte. Um, some of our challenges to date, uh, uh, addressing it from a sort of custom model is going through like all the corporate due diligence and all the uh, pitfalls of an enterprise model. Um, when a company decides they want to have a Facebook page, they don't run that through legal. Right? Somebody in marketing says, okay, we're going to have a Facebook page. They're not going to send Facebook's terms and conditions to legal so they can mark it up. Right now we're confronting that. Um, and so by being more of a platform and more of an obvious, okay, pay, pay to play, this is what it is, um, more companies can come on board simply. Well, you talked about the addressable market of 900 to one and a half. Is that, well, two questions. First. Is that all of the businesses, including SMBs and smaller long tail? And then second, how do you define addressable in this scenario? Sure. Um, addressable, I mean, it, that's a challenge in the sense that addressable can be any company that already has a foundation um, and any company that doesn't, right? So for example, we've... Which our, means any company. Which means any company, exactly. Um, and so how we focus at least initially, is because we're a bootstrap company, we've been through accelerated programs, pattern recognition, we fell out of pattern recognition, so we said, we're gonna do this anyway. Um, so we went to companies in, uh, like a PwC that already, on paper, doesn't even necessarily need us, but realizes the innovation inherent in what we're doing, and has paid for our services, right? Um, but the future opportunity of those companies that really do need us that don't have the resources like a PwC or a Western Union or a Vodafone and want to plug into our platform. And so that's a bigger size of the, of the 10. And that's the one and a half billion opportunity. Right. So how do you vet and select the nonprofits? I mean, I'm assuming you, sure. you're going in and selecting nonprofits and how do you vet them and do companies, um, it sounds like they can decide which nonprofits they want to work with. Yes, um, that's a great question. It comes up every time. 
Um, the answer is we don't at this point. There are lots of great nonprofit organizations that do vet, like Charity Navigator and GuideStar, et cetera. Most of our initiatives are client-driven. So PwC can decide, oh, you know, we're thinking about this list of 200 different nonprofits. And this is actually real life. Um, they decided they wanted to give away $3.7 million. They just gave us a list of 200 nonprofits they were considering uh, across their 21 different markets. We reached out to those nonprofits, said, hey, you're under consideration for a grant. Register for GiveQuest, GiveQuick. Give us your images. Give us your story. And then we created this campaign where the employees can go in, look at these stories, and vote for their favorite ones. And then created a dashboard behind the scenes um, that told PwC who was voting, what level of seniority, what line of business, what office, um, and then the grant making was decided upon that. So we can easily integrate a guide star, a charity navigator functionality, and we do do that so for some basic functionality, but so long as you're a 501c3 registered nonprofit, you're eligible to be on our platform. There are some companies that say, hey, we don't want gun, you know, gun at, uh, we don't want the NRA inside of, we don't want our employees to do that. We can easily manage for that. Time. Thank you. Thank you Thank very you much. Thank you so much. Give quick. Now please welcome to the stage Melanie Smith from Kutching. Hi, I'm Melanie Smith and I'm the founder of Kaching, a mobile app designed to foster financial mindfulness in teenagers. So let's get one thing out of the way. We can agree that teenagers can really be the worst, right? I know this because I spent the past 10 years teaching ninth grade math in New York City public schools. But really, thank you. I love teenagers, and they are our future. And there's a particular group of people that is incredibly invested in that future. And those are their parents. Parents in New York City will spend a ridiculous amount of money to hire tutors for their kids. Tens of thousands of dollars just to make sure their child does well on the SATs. They do this because they see it as an investment in their child's future. But what about making sure that your child is going to be able to be financially independent when they get older? Unfortunately, our schools aren't doing anything to teach kids about personal finance. And the programs that are out there aren't technology-based, so they can't reach all of our kids. And the other thing is they really focus on teaching kids facts rather than helping them develop habits that lead to long-term financial independence. We're about to have an enormous transfer of wealth in this country. Is the next generation prepared to handle this wealth? And what kind of business opportunity does it present? This is where Kaching comes into play. We make it easy for parents to create custodial investment accounts so that their kids can start investing real money in the stock market. We help parents set appropriate savings goals and then use research-backed methods to help kids meet those goals. Now, our parents are the ones executing all trades on our platform, but our Kaching kids are the ones guiding the investment strategy and contributing the bulk of the funds. Let's meet our Kaching kid, Elliot. Elliot babysat this weekend and she earned $20 in cash. Way to go, Elliot. She wants to deposit that $20 into her Kaching. So she's gonna give that $20 to her dad. Now it's her responsibility to log onto her app and send a request to her dad asking him to make an investment. Dad gets a push notification on his phone and can instantly approve the request. The money's taken out of dad's checking and put into Elliot's ka-ching. The market opportunity for this is huge. There is nobody that's going after kids and trying to get them to invest their money in the stock market. Maybe it's because people think kids don't have a lot of money? Well, that's not true. The things kids don't have a lot of are expenses. And you know what, there's a lot of kids, 41 million teens and tweens in the US. And each one of those kids brings with them mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, a whole slew of people onto our platform. And as a, if our Kaching kids have a good experience when they're young, then as they get older, their assets grow, their financial situation gets to be more complicated, they have no reason to leave us. We have a small but agile team that's super motivated to get this product built and out into the market. I have a BS in applied mathematics from Columbia University and a master's in math education from Teachers College, but really, I spent the past 10 years working with students. I understand how teenagers think, I understand how they learn, and I understand family dynamics. 
Our CTO, Jeff, has a background in game design, and our two summer interns are the hardest working in the industry. They just came with me to San Francisco a week and a half ago and didn't sleep for 48 hours. We were in the BNP Paribas International Hackathon, and we, we won. So we are spending the next several months in a digital boot camp preparing to pitch to BNPP executives in Paris at the beginning of December. We are ka and we automate investing for kids. Thank you. Can you talk about how um, the app is connected to the investment platform? Is it individual stocks or is it mutual funds that you're purchasing? So we are advocating a passive investment strategy. We're not about outsmarting the market. It's about outsmarting behavioral pitfalls. So the only product that we let our kids invest in is the Vanguard S&P 500 ETF. We're taking that bet with Warren Buffett, that million dollar bet that the S&P is going to beat any experts, you know, curated fund. Um, and that's all we're offering right now. And why do the parents need to approve the uh, transactions? So legally, the custodian of the account has to do the investing. And so is the idea that I get money from my parents and then give it back to them to invest, or I get money from the world and then give it to my parents to invest? So we definitely are seeing that kids now are being more scrappy and hustling and figuring out how to earn their own money, even if their parent is the employer. Um, by doing chores or making deals with their parents, babysitting is a big source of income for kids, various summer jobs. Um, and then, of course, allowance is their income. So if you get $20 at the beginning of the week for lunch, you can decide, am I going to meet my savings goal by eating free school lunch, or am I going to go to Starbucks every day and then not meet my savings goal? So let me ask you in terms of you're teaching kids to become financially literate, I take it. So by them, invest, like, they get paid and they invest in a, you know, a fund through their parents, make a contribution. Like what are you, how, like, um, kind of what are the value propositions for them to be on this platform? Because, I mean, it's, you know, they're investing in a fund. Are you, are you basically, um, are they going to, their money is growing over time and, and they'll see, like, the growth of their money and that's how they, I mean, just kind of explain. Yeah. So the selling point for kids. The selling point for kids, definitely. So one of the, the inspirations for this app was a young lady named Francesca, who's 14, and she goes to Hunter High School, and she does babysit every weekend. And she's babysitting in Manhattan, so she's earning $60 a week from her babysitting job. And she showed me that she keeps it in a mason jar. And so I went back and I figured out, well, if I had earned $60 a week when I was 14 and invested it all in the S&P, and kept doing that until today, and I'm 33, then right now that $54,000 investment would be $200,000. And so when you tell kids that, that's like, what? Um, so the incentive for them really is to turn their money into huge piles of cash. For parents, we're really emphasizing that this is about delaying gratification and teaching that grit and perseverance, the things that are important in so many aspects of our lives. We're asking kids to save for longer than they've been alive. So that's like ultimate delay. How's it going so far? So we are not, we have not launched yet. We're not a registered investment advisor yet. Um, we started working on this in February of this year. And we have been making a lot of progress. So we're in prototype mode this summer, and we're getting good feedback you know, and some pushback, of course. They're teenagers. Um, as we have people, we're you know, testing our prototype, and we're iterating based on user feedback. Our win um, with BNP Pariba was huge for us. And potentially, if we do well when we demo in Paris, could have our first client, which is the biggest bank in Europe, so not a bad client to have. In time. Thank you. I'll sneak one more in. So curious. <laughs> sneak one? Okay. It'll be quick, I promise. Uh, okay, so I want new shoes and I want to go to the movies, and I'm a grown man, and so I have to assume, well, kind of grown, so I have to assume that a, a kid wants those things just as yeah. much. So it's an interesting behavioral trick to get them to not do that, right? Yeah, and we're not asking them to save 100% of their money. We're saving a percent of it based on um, 
what their income is. And we're calling allowance and everything income. And so if you can start getting in the mindset that you always save 10%, you always save 25%, then when you get your first job at 22, that's just automatic in you. And you can still buy the shoes, but you're gonna make sure that they're the shoes that you really, really want because you have less, you know, less disposable income. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Ka-ching. Please welcome to the stage, Wamaka Niziocha from Gitlinks. Was that okay? Hello? <laughs> That's good, thank you. Okay. Hope everyone's doing well today. Is it? Yeah. Um, my name is Wamaka and I'm excited to tell you about our company, Gitlinks where we help companies use open source to its full potential. So in the past decade, the supply of open source has exploded. Developers everywhere are grabbing this public software, they're using it, and it's great because now you don't have to build from scratch. Even companies are adopting it and they're adding it to their software stack. But these companies didn't write the software. And when you don't write the code yourself, you expose yourself to a lot of problems. Problems like not paying attention to the nuances of the licenses. There have been cases where people have actually been sued and they've lost their intellectual property. You can also lose your customer's trust and you can lose customers and their trust when you have a security breach, not to talk of the um, unbelievable amount of time you will spend fixing bugs. So this all boils down to you losing time and money. So we want you to pick the best software, and that's why we score everything. Our scores are real time, and our algorithm uses over 40 different metrics to tell you the overall support structure and the health of a project. With Gitlinks, you can manage all your open source across your entire company, and you can avoid those problems that come with picking the wrong software. So we have over 50,000 companies in our target market, and we sell enterprise licenses from $100,000 to $200,000, and that consists of a base license fee plus a per product fee for everything that we monitor. Our total addressable market is $4.8 billion, so the opportunity is huge. And for my favorite part, meet our team. We all met at grad school at Cornell Tech, and we're working on Gitlinks full time now. Ian is our CEO. He knows data analysis, and he's a second time founder. He also holds an MBA. Nick is our CTO. He's worked at a couple of startups, like Lincurious, which was famous for it being the official tool used to investigate the Panama Papers. He also holds a master's in computer science. I'm Wamaka, I'm the COO, and I'm also a second time founder. I've created software for Chevron, and I also hold a master's in computer science. So we've raised uh, a little over 100,000, and we are actively fundraising right now. Uh, we're also building the alpha version of our search engine that we will release at the end of this summer, as well as we're in the process of closing uh, pilot customers. And we will release our enterprise platform by the summer of 2017. We're Gitlinks, helping you use open source to its full potential. Thank you. Can you talk a little bit about your competition? How, how different are you from a company like Black Duck? Oh, that's a great question. So um, Black Duck focuses a lot on licenses. So let's say there's a, a merger or an acquisition about to happen. They do that due diligence and basically give you an Excel sheet that says this is the software you're using and these are the licenses that are you know, along with it as well as the dependencies and their licenses. And so we take a much more holistic approach. We also look at licenses, but we look at the health of the project, we look at the community support, which is something that no one else is doing. So it's really hard to kind of gather this data and tell you there's one guy working on this thing, he may disappear and there's no support for it. Or if you post a question for this on Stack Overflow, you can get a response in XYZ time. Or 
maybe 75% of the questions on Stack Overflow do go answered, or maybe 10% of them do go answered. So it's kind of that holistic, you know, you want to be able to pick the best software, but it's not only licenses and it's not only security, it's about when you get stuck and you, you know, need to move forward and you're working for a company, which piece of software are you going to be able to use and, you know, build your, your infrastructure on, like, you know, like solidly and reliably, so. Do you show the raw data, that this raw data that you're talking about here in the dashboard that people are reviewing? We, we are very transparent, but we, we, sh we show the data that we collect, but we don't show all of it. So a lot of our scores are kind of built up into formulas. And so we will show you, you know, um, this is how much is on Stack Overflow. This is how much funding a specific you know, company got. They're backed by Google and this, but there's a lot that goes underneath those scores, and we kind of calculate that up and you know, give that to the public. So we want to take the approach of almost like a Google, where you do show people the rank of each project, and you do kind of tell them what goes behind every score, but we don't want people kind of gaming the system and trying to figure out ways to get their software or their open source pushed higher. So. Super interesting. So how do you build trust in your scores then if you don't show the, the core theory that goes into them? Right, so we, we do show basically everything. Uh, I guess it's a video. We do show that we know what goes into the score, but um, let's say we uh, calculate, uh, we also look at IRC and jitter data, which is basically chats that are happening. And so we uh, you know, say, well, this is what's, these are how many chats are going on. If you, uh, you know, post a question, you're going to get a response in XYZ time. We do show that, but we wouldn't go as far as showing, oh, you know, we looked at maybe, you know, five million different chats, and we looked at it from this time to this time, and there, it gets to a point where you can actually give people data overload, and it doesn't really, it's not really digestible anymore, so. Are you also analyzing indemnification as well? Because you were talking earlier about just the policies um, that you could, I guess, violate if you're using open source. Oh, right. So um, what we do is we work with corporations, and they have, every different corporation has a different policy. So some corporations are very fine with MIT licenses. Some are not okay with a GPL license because that comes with other stipulations. And so we kind of bake that into our... Um, our the score data. Exactly, our platform. And al along with that, if a company says, hey, we don't allow this license, we can actually filter the data that, or the projects that come up for that company. So it doesn't allow them to, a software developer, to pull in a piece of software that's not, uh, you know, approved by their organization. And time. <sighs> you have to ask the question? Thank you. Thank you, Gitlings. And now for our final pitch, Melissa Halfon from VidCode. Last but not least. Last but not least. All right. Hi, I'm Melissa Halfon, and I'm the co-founder of VidCode, where we teach students to code the things that they love. At VidCode, we build a bridge between the amazing technologies that kids hold in their hands, things like Instagram and Snapchat, and we teach them how to build those experiences using computer programming. And here's how it works. A student uploads their own photo or their own video and modifies that content using JavaScript. Uh, they can make immediate connections by seeing, as they write programs, what their code does to that imagery making their learning connection stronger and providing sort of instant feedback. Their projects can then just be shared on social media and with peers. And at the beginner level, this looks like building stat motion animations and custom video filters. At the advanced level, it's 3D graphics and VR projects. So it's rigorous, but it's also social and creative. And classrooms around the world are using this approach to teach students who are traditionally left out of computer science. And it's working. Two-thirds of our student user base is female, and over 50% it represents black and Latino communities. Our market includes the over half billion students in secondary school worldwide, and meets the needs that all schools have to equip students with 21st century skills. 
In the coding landscape, there's an abundance of resources at two extremes. One is at the elementary school level, and the other is for adults who are looking to build their professional skills. But there's a big gap in between, and that's where we come in, especially at the middle school level. Our product is positioned between the visual block-based tools for younger students and those that are continuing education tools to help its users build career and college readiness. We sell our software through student licenses at $10 to $25 per student per year, and that grants access to the platform, to curriculum, and to teacher training. Everything that a school needs for a successful classroom integration. Teachers need training and students need engaging content. We work with distribution partners like Intel Education to reach broad populations of students both in the US and internationally. And this year, we've closed deals with the Girl Scouts and the New York City Department of Ed. And we've been recognized for our contribution to innovative education. Last year, Common Sense Media called us one of the best learning websites of 2015. And what we hear from our teachers is that the tool is easy and simple to use, even without any previous computer science knowledge. As female engineers, we built this tool with girls in mind. But what we discover is that it works well for any student without a computer science background. It meets teens and tweens where they are and lets them be creative with material that's relevant to their lives today. And as a team, we are committed to making that same kind of access to computer science available to all students. You're selling it into schools, right? Into schools, yes. And so is it meant to be a supplement to a math teacher, or is it meant to be replacing a computer science teacher? Like, where does it fit? So it's, it's paired with, so it's a tool for teachers to use. So it's certainly not taking away the kind of human element there. Um, and we really see both of those integrations, either as a cross-disciplinary tool, which is very much a kind of strategy, especially here in New York City, with like, there's not enough computer science teachers, so let's, how can we help and, you know, a math teacher or a science teacher do a unit that integrates with computer science? So that's definitely one integration. And the other is within a classic CS course where they would be doing the, the JavaScript unit. Have you done any analysis on kind of the conversion rate of the free sign-up users to your, I guess, the basic tier? Yeah, so, I mean, we're definitely more focused on, like, a B2B strategy and a direct sales strategy. So we always have free products and free projects available just so that, you know, students and teachers can do kind of hour of code style, um, you know, implementations and play with it. So we haven't monitored that um, specific conversion because we're really more focused on direct sales. How many schools are you currently working with? Uh, so we service about 30,000 students. Uh, that's kind of the free and paid versions, and that's in uh, 100 schools either in the US or internationally. What's the, what constitutes success here, uh, which I guess is a, a pre-indicator of whether a school will churn in the future? Um, the, I think there's two levels of it. The first is um, something that's very immediate, which is engagement. So kind of seeing that after just one classroom session, students can make something. They can, they can make these really tangible and visual projects. And so that level of engagement is really our first met metric of success. The longer term engagement is obviously the learning outcome directly related to computer science. And so for us at this point, that means, you know, we have semester length, you know, year length JavaScript material. It's about students at the end of that having that foundational knowledge that can then be applied to other areas of computer science and for them to continue on a computer science track. And do you guys either feel like it's your responsibility or take responsibility for doing the like pedagogical outcome work yourselves or is it just if you guys are happy, then we won't hear from you. Um, in terms of the pedagogical, I mean, we, we provide curriculum, so we definitely, you know, play Let me around ask that. In the question, in the sense of, uh, do you measure whether kids are making stuff and sell that back to the uh, to the teachers, like, see, it works, or how do you how do you guys close the loop? We definitely um, we haven't actually had the the ask to sort of like present that information, but that is something that the student or that the teacher really has, and you know, from this kind of last year of data from like the 2015-16 school year going into the next, I would definitely say that that contributes to the success for a school to like continue, right, for the next year, which is, you know, literal tangible projects that the students have made, but then also that learning assessment. So we definitely observe that, but the teachers also see that material kind of from their portal. Have you found that there have been teachers who haven't wanted to use it? Um, I mean, when a school adopts, it's, it's certainly something that, you know, is kind of an opt-in. So, you know, here in New York City, we have 
25 different teachers who have really opted in for that. So um, there hasn't really been a push onto them approach as much as hopefully you know, pulling them in because it's something that resonates with what their students are interested in and is really easy for non-technical teachers. So those are kind of the people who find us. Okay, I'm going to ask one more. Uh, and one more question. <laughs> You're curious. These are great pitches. Uh, is, is there any direct to the user model that you guys are trying to push? So, you know, a sixth grader brings it to, to his or her teacher, like, can we use this? Because I've been using it at home. Have you thought about that? I mean, there's a hypothesis that, you know, a, a student with or the right engagement can make that uh, kind of buy-in decision for a school, but I think it's, it's kind of a far-off hypothesis for us. The at-home model isn't one that we're aggressively pursuing right now, but again, always kind of a free model for them, for, you know, a parent and a child to um, experiment with it and at least get that initial exposure um, accomplished at home. And that's all the time that we have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bitcoin. And that concludes... And that concludes the showcase. So thank you entrepreneurs, thank you sponsors, thank you judges. Please stick around for the closing ceremony when we're revealing the, the winner of the showcase. Uh, thank you.